Hello, everybody, and welcome to this book conversation between Benjamin Taylor and Maureen Cargan about Ben's new memoir, Here We Are, My Friendship with Philip Roth. I am Rosemary Steinbaum. I'm a trustee of the Newark Public Library, and I'm chair of the Newark Public Library Foundation. There are over 60 participants signed up for this conversation. And you come from across the country and also from outside of the United States. And to all, on behalf of the staff and the trustees of the Newark Public Library and of the Board of the Library Foundation, I want to wish everyone continued safety and good health. We are gathering at a time amid paroxysms of pain and anger due not only to the horrific death of George Floyd, but also to the horrific toll of the epidemic among communities of color throughout our society. From our library, I shout out to our great city of Newark and to our mayor and an expression of our deepest gratitude for remaining peaceful while expressing outrage. We at the Newark Public Library have, somewhat paradoxically, been able to do much, much more in a time when we all feel that we are so limited in everything we are able to do. Since the library has gone to all virtual programming, there have been, for example, 94 children's story times with 90,000 views. There have been six programs in Spanish and Portuguese language with 12,500 views. We have had seven programs in American Sign Language that have garnered 112,000 views. And in genealogy, always a popular one, we've had three programs with 3,500 views. Similarly, while we have not yet opened the Philip Roth Personal Library, via Zoom, we had one successful program in late April, two are scheduled in June, and two more over the summer. All are recorded and available for your viewing. This afternoon's discussion is a conversation about Benjamin Taylor's book, Here We Are, My Friendship with Philip Roth. Talking with Ben is Maureen Corrigan. Ben Taylor is a writer of fiction and nonfiction, as well as an editor of the Letters of Saul Bellow. You can find the complete list of Ben's books on his website, but if I may recommend two of my favorites, the Hue and Cry at Our House, Ben's memoir of his family during the time that he was growing up, and Proust, The Search, his biography of Proust, which is, miraculously, both readable and profound. Maureen Corrigan is probably familiar to many of you as the book reviewer on Fresh Air. NPR's interview program from WHYY in Philadelphia. Maureen's reviews are both compassionate and clear-sighted. And when I heard her review of Ben's book, I knew she would be the ideal companion for this conversation with Ben. Maureen teaches at Georgetown University, where she is the Nikki and Jamie Grant Distinguished Professor of the Practice in Literary Criticism. We are fortunate to be with both of them for this afternoon's conversation. Ben will begin by reading from his Roth memoir, Here We Are. Then Maureen and Ben will discuss the memoir, its author, and Roth. Participants, please type your questions into the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. Please do not use chat. I will be monitoring the Q&A and I'll come back on to pose your questions to Ben and Maureen following their conversation. Thank you, thank you all. And now I'll turn it over to Ben. Thank you, thank Rose. you Rose. The, the, 
uh, do I get a, am I getting a feedback? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, the Newark Library means so much to me and uh, uh, your kind words m mean so much to me. Uh, I would just mention that it was in the reading room of the Newark Public Library that Philip r r discovered literature uh, and uh, uh, he uh, always held a very special place in his heart for that beautiful building and all that goes on in it. What I'm going to do is uh, read for about 15 minutes or 10 or 15 uh, uh, from uh, a uh, section towards the end of my book. I'll just leap in. Philip phones to say he is poorly, one of his old fashioned turns of phrase. I say I'll stay with him that night at his apartment. Around two in the morning, I hear him cry out from his room. He's in trouble. I dial 911. Paramedics arrive with exemplary speed, but have trouble defibrillating him. I can tell by the way they are talking that he could die. After an infinitely long minute or two, his heartbeat reverts. We transport him first to Lenox Hill Hospital, then later that day to New York Presbyterian, which he will never leave. My routine for the next 22 mornings is to walk from my apartment to Columbus Circle and take the A train uptown to New York Presbyterian. What news on the Rialto, he tends to say when I come through the door of his room. Anything can become an adventure, even a ride on the A train. One morning, a strapping young panhandler enters the sparsely populated car I'm in and says, ladies and gents, ladies and gents, I am attempting to raise some funds, if any of you prima donnas care to help. I report this and Philip throws back his head. Oh, Saul would have loved that. He'd have used it. Frankly, I didn't see any prima donnas on that train. Unless he meant you, Ben. It was to be our last laugh together. Licked and dreared, he used to say of anyone dead, lies in the ground in Yiddish. He admired this blunt bit of Yiddish. Pity our erstwhile mother tongue, spoken by Ashkenazim going back to the time of Chaucer and now reduced in America to stock phrases. A European language that produced a great literature, now consigned to Borscht Belt gags. Like him, I can't help imagining loved ones lying in the earth, as Yiddish would have it the slow processes going on down there, down where there's nothing but what's called in Sabbath theater, the inescapable rectitude, not to mention the boredom of death, where you're deprived of the fun of existing that even a flea must feel. Saul Bellow was certain he would see his parents again after death. Philip Roth was as certain he would not. This is one way of assessing the difference between them. Who does not grasp the fierce impulse to believe? Consideration of all the eons before you existed provokes no shudder. Consideration of all the eons when you will no longer exist is simply unacceptable. How can this immense datum I am be extinguished? How can mama and papa be altogether gone, simply gone? How can it be that we won't be together again? How can that be? When Prince Andre dies in War and Peace, Natasha turns to Princess Maria and says, speaking for all of us, but where and what is he now? Philip's solution was to rename mortality immortality and declare himself indestructible till death. It's not a bad gloss on what's always been the ultimate human problem. Strolling past the Time Warner Center at Columbus Circle one spring day a few years back, we take note of the New York City atheists who've set up shop under a drooping tent with eyes and glass windows. Within are the washed out unbelievers 
purveying their pamphlets and hoping to engage passers-by in phys- philosophical conversation. Why must the atheist booth look so sad, Philip asks. St. Patrick's in Ain. The big money is behind the fairy tales. All those centuries of fairy tales. Wish away the fairy tales, I say, and you wish away all the art, music, and poetry they've engendered. Whenever we're walking, and Philip has a thought, he'll stop in his tracks. Religions are the refuge of the weak-minded. I'd dispense with all the art, music, and even poetry they've engendered if we could finally be free of them. The B minor mass, I asked, the Sistine ceiling, George Herbert's poems. A dog walker comes past with eight or 10 doggies of all sizes and shapes. You see that, he says, perfect concord among the breeds, perfect amity. The border collies admire the Heinz 57s. The Newfoundlands would make love to the dachshunds if they could. And why? Because dogs are wise enough to have no religion. We had a certain amount of God talk at our house. God knows whether you're lying, and that sort of thing I say. Was there no talk about him in your family? None, fortunately. Our Zion was the United States. Our divinity was Franklin Roosevelt. My mother lit Friday night candles, true, but only out of piety for her own mother. I think the romantics got it right, I say. They announced that God and the imagination are one. If I had to declare a religion when passing through customs, that formula would be it. In another mood, Philip exempted the great reality reflecting religion, as he called it, of the ancient Greeks from his century. He writes in the human stain, not the Hebrew God, infinitely alone, infinitely obscure, monomaniacally the only God there is, was, and always will be, with nothing better to do than worry about Jews, and not the perfectly desexualized Christian man-God and his uncontaminated mother and all the guilt and shame that an exquisite unearthliness inspires. Instead, the Greek Zeus, entangled in adventure, vividly expressive, capricious, sensual, exuberantly wedded to his own rich existence, anything but alone and anything but hidden. Instead, the divine stain. If the Greek gods still existed, imagine the concessions they'd set up at Columbus Circle. Atheism would have to fold its tent and slink away. And I married a communist, Mary Ringgold offers a taxonomy of American Jews. Reading it, you cannot help spotting your relations. There are the affable Jews, the inappropriate laughing Jews, the I love everyone deeply Jews, the I was never so moved Jews, the mama and papa were saints Jews, the I do it all for my gifted children Jews, the I'm sitting here listening to Itzhak Perlman and I'm crying Jews, and so on. With lightning speed, they'd shed the ways of the shtetl and made themselves pillars of Americanism. They knew the brightness of their prospects here corresponded to the worst event in 30 centuries of Jewish history, that they were flourishing even as their European counterparts vanished into the abyss. What this country has given the Jews, I say one evening, and Philip cuts me off. It's what the Jews have given this country in the sciences, the arts, in medicine, in philanthropy. And do you know why, Ben? Because night after night, year after year, decade after decade, we've gone to bed sober. It's as simple as that. How could we have avoided the resentment of our hard-drinking countrymen? Did I ever tell you about my dealings with that dipso, Capote? He had indeed, and has performed the playlet for me. In act one, he is at home watching Johnny Carson when Truman comes on and explains that culture in America is under the thumb of a a Jewish mafia that runs from Columbia University to Columbia Pictures. In act two, Philip, seeing Capote at George Plimpton's a few weeks later, corners him and says, I saw you on The Tonight Show and take the gravest exception 
to what you said. Nothing I can do about that, says Truman, and flits away. Curtain. What a dope I was to let him get off a line like that before vanishing into his golden cloud. And me left to my umbrage? No, the author of In Cold Blood had no use for earnest, striving, Jewishy Philip Roth. My name was not in the New York Social Register, and I didn't know how to drink or even smoke a cigarette. Plimpton had been among Philip's first Gentile friends. I thought they'd all be like that, he says with a laugh. His sleekness, lightly held entitlement, and insouciance were a revelation. His books of participatory journalism pioneered something, a self-deflating style of autobiography born of supreme self-assurance. After reading in manuscript Exit Ghost, the final novel narrated by Nathan Zuckerman, with its eight-page excursus on George, I showed Philip an extraordinary photo I'd found. In it, Plimpton is seated at Elaine's, the now defunct Manhattan eatery famed for superior clientele and ghastly food. Revelers surround George. It looks as though the fun will never stop. Everything Zuckerman had fled from when he retreated to the Berkshires is summed up in the glamor of that image. Here is the cover of your book, I said. This photo is full of the enticements that Nathan, that ghost of a man, gave up for art. But the photographer foolishly drove a hard bargain and Philip decided against the image. I still wish he'd shelled out the extortionate fee. That would have been some book jacket. Zuckerman, who narrates nine of Philip's books, is overwhelmingly an embodiment of iron discipline and self-denying artistic aspiration. The young acolyte we meet in The Ghostwriter metamorphoses into the scandalously successful author in Zuckerman Unbound and The Anatomy Lesson in Prague Orgy. When we meet him next in The Counterlife, he's married for a fourth time to Maria Freshfield and expecting a child. Wives one, two, and three, Zuckerman had dispatched with an airy phrase in the anatomy lesson, the puzzle of passionless marriages to th three exemplary women. In the facts, published after the counter life, Maria is still expecting, seems like quite a long pregnancy. What it really seems is that Philip had no particular interest in Nathan's amatory or conjugal life, to say nothing of his parental prospects. Easier to imagine Garbo with a baby than Nathan Zuckerman. He stands instead for artistic struggle, not love or marriage or parenthood. And the realist who made him quite casually drop the ball when called upon to give his hero narrator a convincing marital history. In Exit Ghost, the final Zuckerman book, our hero, having earlier told us of Swede Lebov, Ira Ringgold, and Coleman Silk, now returns Rip Van Winkle-like from his long years alone to a vastly changed New York. The year is 2004. Zuckerman is so cut off as to have barely heard of 9-11. Everything puzzles him. Having consecrated himself completely, year in and year out, to the turning of raw life into words on the page, he is a revenant among flesh and blood people but a revenant longing for one last outburst of feeling, one last bit of unwritten, untransformed, real life. Nothing doing. Experience is over for him long since. He's been impotent and incontinent for years. A man removed, as Philip puts it in an interview, from all turbulence, from all his deeds and misdeeds and the distraction of the pursuit of happiness. The depictor, rather, of other lives whose personal trials and historic travails come to possess his imagination entirely and feed on the strength of his mental energy. After several days, he flees New York as rashly as he'd arrived. Thus, Philip says goodbye to Nathan Zuckerman, his intricate invention. Gone for good are the last words of the book. Passing by Columbus Circle on May 20th, 2018, 
the day it became apparent that Philip would not recover. A lovely spring day, gift of a day, a day lacking nothing. I looked in vain for our atheists, gone for good. Their place had been taken by the Lyndon LaRouchians with pictures of their current hero, Donald Trump. Three years earlier, they were displaying images of Obama with a Hitler mustache. I am a man slow to anger who once there may turn violent. Anyhow, here is what happened next. I ripped down one of the pictures. Mr. Please, cried a LaRouchian. I pushed their literature, you should pardon the expression, off the table and into the gutter where it belonged. Call the cops, another LaRouchian implored passersby. They just laughed, but I was not laughing. I was in a rage and grieving and spotless as the lamb. Well, thank you. Jen, thank you so much. That, that's such a rich chapter. And um, as I said in my review for Fresh Air, one of the things I so treasure about your memoir of your friendship with Philip Roth is, is certainly hearing Roth's voice again. And uh, it just leaps off the page, as does yours. Um, before we get into talking about your memoir, though, I, I, I do feel like we need to nod to the times. As Rosemary said, we're, we're having this conversation in such unprecedented times, at a time of a pandemic, massive unemployment, protests in the streets against police violence against African Americans. Do you have any educated guesses of what Philip Roth might have made of this time, this incredible, uh, I don't know, kind of extraordinary version of what he called the indigenous American berserk? Uh, yes, exactly. I think he would have pulled forth just that phrase, the American Berserk. Mm -hmm. uh, um, or as William Carlos Williams put it, the pure products of America going crazy. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, I, I won't hazard a guess as to what he would have said, but uh, I know what he would have done. He would have gone to his yellow pad and to his keyboard. Uh, Philip's way of coping with any embattlement was to do that, was to sit down and write. And uh, uh, this uh, continued apace, even in his retirement. He did stop making art. He did stop writing for publication, but he didn't stop writing. It, it seems from everything I've read, including your wonderful memoir, that that was really how he spent his life, uh, getting up, writing, being solitary for the most part, and then maybe, I guess at night, having, of course, dinners with you and other people. But he, he, he I mean, something that I read, someone had asked him to take care of their cat. And after a few days, he, he had to give the cat back. It was too intrusive to have that other presence in, in, in his house. It was too mesmerized. There were two cats. He was <laughs> two kittens. He was too mesmerized by them and had to take them back. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> Philip had the best work ethic I've ever witnessed. And when I would say this to him, he would simply shrug and say, I'm just doing what my parents did. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he went to work uh, uh, to make novels the way his father went to work to sell insurance. Uh, mm -hmm. Philip would get up in the morning, make his breakfast, and then he'd go to work. And then he'd break for a, a lunch, and then he'd go back to work. And then he'd uh, uh, go for a swim, and come in and have his dinner. And then after dinner, he would go back to work. Uh, and uh, then at the very end of the evening, when he was in the midst of a book, uh, he would have uh, the worksheets of the day in bed with him. Uh, so you, you are right. It was like Nathan Zuckerman's A Life, profoundly consecrated to the turning around of sentences and the creation of new life on the page. And, and when he decided to end his writing of novels, I mean, as you say, the writing went on, but he, he stopped writing novels. 
the reason was that he didn't think the next novel would be as good and he didn't want to waste his time on something that wasn't as good as the body of 31 books that he had produced. He rightly uh, felt that Nemesis was a high note mm -hmm. uh, to end on. And, uh, and he was also a little haunted by the process of writing that book. It, it took more drafts. I can't remember the number. I think it may have taken seven drafts rather than the usual four or five. And he saw that his physical stamina was giving way. He'd gone to shorter novels after The Plot Against America, but they're some of his best work. Yeah. Uh, I think Exit Ghost is a masterpiece and Nemesis, uh, Every Man. Mm -hmm. uh, these are formidable books. I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about how your friendship began. Um, it's the friendship that informs Here We Are, your memoir. How did the two of you meet? How, how did you realize that you, I don't know, shared something that would result in such a special friendship? We met at, in October of uh, 94 at the uh, uh, 60th birthday of our uh, great friend, Joel Canero. And uh, I, I was much more impressed by this meeting than, than he was. Uh, uh, he, he claimed afterwards not to even remember this, but uh, that was when we met. And then I think it was in 90, must have been 98, when he published the, uh, I Married a Communist, uh, I guess it was, uh, I wrote him a letter and a few days later, the phone rang uh, and uh, we began what was in those early years, a telephonic friendship. Then I moved back to New York full time and he was in New York uh, more, much more. And uh, uh, we began having lunch together and then dinner together and uh, talking on the phone. And, uh, and uh, Philip was an aficionado of the telephone. He loved the telephone. Uh, in the great old days of telephoning, he, the, the calls could start at about nine in the evening and then stretch on through until bedtime. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he was at his most antic and hilarious on the telephone. Then he went over to email and we were in touch every day by email, but it, it, we tended to see each other a couple of times a week and to be in touch every day. Mm -hmm. So that's how it developed organically. Uh, we, we just discovered that we delighted in each other. The friendship mm -hmm. had no ulterior motives. Friendship should not have any ulterior mm -hmm. motives. And it was, our life together was as plotless as friendship ought to be. It had no dramatic arc. Uh, it wasn't like a, uh, a, a marriage, it's still less like a love affair. It was mm -hmm. plotless. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, one of the things about Here We Are that I really appreciated was, and I mean this as a compliment, that it felt plotless. I felt as a reader that I was with you. I was with you walking around Manhattan and in those restaurants and then sometimes at, at Roth's house in the country. And the way that, right, these conversations would just naturally evolve, uh, it drew me in so deeply to the memoir. You were 20 years younger and gay and Roth most adamantly was heterosexual. Uh, did those differences ever mean anything to the two of you? Philip had had gay friends all his adult life. That meant, meant absolutely uh, nothing uh, uh, to him. It, uh, it, it gave us lots of uh, notes to compare, you could say. Uh, um, as for the fact that we were a generation apart, uh, well, I, I I feel a certain reverence for that generation. I think they did great things, mm -hmm. astounding things. Those people born in the 20s and the 30s, yeah. they were people, uh, they were children in the depression and they saw fear in their parents' eyes mm -hmm. and it made workhorses of them. And my own, our own generation yeah. has not uh, uh, come up to scratch by comparison, I don't think. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, at a certain point, Philip Roth said to you, 
maybe, maybe right about us, maybe right about our friendship. And the result is this book. Did that have any effect on you day to day, maybe being more conscious of conversations and thinking to yourself, oh, I, I want to use that if I ever write about us. So, and, and how did you do this? Did you take notes at night after you had spent some time with Roth? Well, uh, I, I, I've been taking notes. I mean, I'm, I'm a writer. I write things down habitually. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was a long time before the idea of this book uh, dawned on him uh, and uh, and it was it was he who gave the idea for the book to me that's true mm -hmm. um, and I suppose at that point I begin I, I did begin to write th write things down more aggressively uh, and also to try to remember verbatim what was said I uh, in, in the human cry at our house, I was remembering things said more than half a century ago. And, uh, uh, and yet I sometimes think I got it down verbatim, uh, exactly what my mother said, exactly what my father said. Uh, the, uh, the inner ear has a way of preserving what's most significant verbatim. At least this is my experience. And, uh, uh, and yet I didn't, just trust myself to memory. A part of the book comes out of uh, uh, my memory for what was said. Part of the book comes out of uh, uh, the notes I made right along. But uh, this friendship wasn't forged in order that I could write about him. As one reviewer suggested, Roth must have identified me as somebody who was going to take down his obiter dicta. That, that's not at all, all the case. We, we, we liked each other a lot. That's all. It's no more complicated than that. And the idea for the book came um, quite late in Philip's life. Did you ever have an occasion to run anything by him or, or, or to ask his permission? If you could write about certain things? No, but he did say to me, uh, uh, in order that you have complete freedom, uh, this is not a book I ever want to read. I said, what exactly, what exactly do you mean by that? And he said, you can write it now if you want, but publish it after uh, I die. Hmm. Yeah, that he did say. That's very generous, I think. Uh, my feeling about memoir is that candor is the passport uh, mm -hmm. to everything and, and for uh, such a book to be worthwhile at all it has to be completely frank yeah. so the idea of uh, uh, spiffing Philip up for presentation uh, uh, to the world was very alien to me I knew I had to uh, tell everything as I saw it well I think you you do a wonderful job of walking that line. I mean, there, there's, there's so many passages, so many stories you tell where I, I wish I had been in the room too, you know, just laughing and um, I don't know, the, way, the way that, that Roth looked at life and looked at people and just so sharp and smart about things. But on the other hand, you do talk about that writing that he did after he stopped writing fiction um, which you say a thousand page manuscript mostly filled of, with grievances <laughs> two five hundred page manuscripts, but he was uh, he really felt he was establishing a record for posterity mm -hmm. and, and Philip was uh, a, a maniac for control and for con he wanted to control what can 't be controlled, which is other uh, other people 's perceptions of you. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was, those were notes made for, uh, for his biographer. Uh, but this memoir has got to read them too. Yeah. I want to ask you one more question about writing. Uh, Roth showed you drafts of his novels. Uh, Start, starting with uh, the, the first manuscript uh, I, I read and commented on, was the plot against America. Okay, well, that's, that's a good one <laughs> to be commenting on. 
do you feel that his writing influenced you and, and vice versa? I mean, do you feel like you had an influence on his writing? Oh, to, to, the, to the latter question, no, absolutely not. Uh, I, had, I, had no, I, I, I had no influence on his writing. I was, uh, uh, you know, I had a certain feeling of filial piety and I think this is something felt not just by little guys like me, but but by geniuses. It's what Melville felt about Hawthorne. It's what uh, uh, Edith Wharton felt about Henry James. It's what Elizabeth Bishop felt about Marianne Moore and what James Merrill felt about Auden. Uh, these, uh, there's something mighty about the, the people who are a generation older than oneself. Mm -hmm. I feel a little uh, small, uh, not in their shadow, but in their light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, certainly no question of influence running from me to him any more than, uh, any more than uh, uh, Henry James could have been influenced by Edith Lloyd. Okay. That just wasn't on. But uh, as for Philip influencing me, uh, you know, there's a percussive power in Philip's prose that I tremendously admire, but would never be able to imitate. On the whole, the American writer whose, whose prose style has influenced me the most and to which I'm most beholden is a very different sort of figure. Willa Gather uh, is, uh, is who has, who stylistically has influenced me most certainly much more than Hemingway or Faulkner or or your Fitzgerald whom I revere uh, uh, or Bello or Roth um, no there's something there's a kind of uh, 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 something quintessential in Cather that I'm drawn to so I had a prose style of my own uh, um, and brought it to the uh, to the task. Uh, I think it would have been disastrous to the book if it were a pastiche of Raw. Just as it, what if my Proust biography had been a pastiche of Marcel Proust's prose style? That would have been awful. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, imitation imitation is death. I mean, but but influence is everything. Yeah, you internalize these things and they. They seep into your bones, and then because uh, you've read things that deeply, so deeply that they become part of your DNA, they are there without without your being imitative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the passages that I loved in, in your book and, and quoted in my review was a conversation you were having with Roth, and he talked about specificity as being essential to his technique as a writer. And that um, you, you quote him as saying, he wouldn't know what to do with a big idea if it, were, if it showed up at his door delivered by the FedEx man. He'd say, no thanks, no big ideas, no big think ideas. One of the, one of the ways in which he was so specific was about place and here we are, at least virtually, in Newark. I, I, I wonder um, if you would talk about Roth as being somehow that, that bard of Northern Jersey, the way that Chandler is the bard of LA, and you know, we could go down the list. I mean, how that place influenced him. Oh, yes, I uh, guess. It was his Yoknipatofa County. <laughs> uh, a little posted stamp of ground, as Faulkner used to say, <laughs> stands. For the, the entire moral universe, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, this is what Dublin was for Joyce. Uh, he, uh, I wrote book after book uh, that, that either has Newark as the setting or uh, Newark as the point of origin of mm -hmm. characters, and uh, didn't feel he needed cosmopolitanism. He thought that would be really inimical to art. I think he really thought art ought to be provincial. Mm -hmm. And then in your, then in your 
active worldly life, you can be a cosmopolitan, which he became in the course of editing writers from the other Europe in the course of the 70s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So introduced the English speaking world to Kundera and to Bruno Schultz and to numerous other uh, uh, East Central European writers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't he call you a homegrown cosmopolitan? Wasn't that uh... okay, the nicest co comment I've ever made? I said, well, I, I did ask him what he meant by that. He said, yeah, well, yeah, you speak French, but with an atrocious accent. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, thinking about Newark, I, of course, I'm thinking about the plot against America and the recent television production of it, which I, I wonder what you thought of that, of that production. Well, um, the book is narrated by a nine, 10 and 11 year old. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the book has a lot of charm uh, amid the grit and gloom. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a dystopian world in which a, a charming uh, uh, master of ceremonies is taking us through these dark events, a proto-fascist uh, uh, presidency. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, David Simons, I think, wisely chose not to uh, do that, to disengage the story from little Philip's point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, but the end result is something much less funny and with much less charm, much grittier and more painful and the book remember has a happy ending yes yeah <laughs> the Lindbergh presidency the misbegotten Lindbergh presidency ends and American history uh, and, and FDR re returns to power and American history resumes its known course that's not what happens at the end uh, of David Simon's plot against America not at all no much no. Better, and in keeping with the historical moment in which David Simon Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another book in, where Newark and, and the surrounding area really comes to the fore is um, Roth's wonderful memoir about his father, Patrimony. And um, I think I've, I've read Patrimony maybe three times. I, I, I just, there's something about it that, that really speaks to me um, and that caretaking that he gave of, of his father. Um, do you think Roth himself regretted not being a father? He writes so movingly about his own father and, and his influence on him. Was there any regret that you sensed? No, never. He enjoyed other people's children. But <laughs> the thing about other people's children is that they're, they're, uh, they're on hand for the afternoon and then they're whisked away. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't think he. Uh, I don't think he had any hankering ever. He was a stepfather, mm -hmm. uh, twice, and with both marriages, he was a stepfather. Mm -hmm. That was quite enough for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Well, I, I I want to leave enough time for the the folks in the audience to hear some of their questions um, presented to you. So I want to, I want to end by asking one more question about, about Roth's other kind of children, his, his novels. Um, which one is your favorite and which one do you think will really be celebrated? I don't know, 50 years from now, hundred years from now as the masterpiece. My personal favorite is the human stain, which tells the story of a black, white man, a man, white seeming black man who crosses the color line and lives as a Jewish intellectual. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, nowhere does he get more deeply into the miscegenated nature of American civilization than in that book. And I think it's a book to put beside uh, oh, Beloved and, and Black Boy and Invisible Man mm -hmm. and the other essential books about race in America. Uh, so I would, I would pick that, though, of course, there's so many others. I have a special liking for a crazy book uh, called Operation Shylock. And, <laughs> and, uh, like everyone, I, I love American pastoral and feel it has an, an anthem-like power uh, as a 
report on the late 60s and their culmination in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, as for patrimony, when I was writing, uh, here we are, I did not find a single model to base myself on except for patrimony. Mm -hmm. Patrimony was the book I looked to. I thought, well, yeah, there's a memoir. That's, yeah. I, yeah, I can see that. Thank you so much, Ben. There's a memoir about filial piety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Thank you, ben. A beautiful reader, beautiful questioner, and I and you really have uh, helped us get in under the skin of uh, the book, which is uh, lets us in on its own merits. But thank you so much. Um, the questions that have come in from our participants, some of them look at specific Roth works and some of them are more personal. And I'm going to, I think, lead with some of the questions about specific books since that's what Maureen, in a way, was just asking you about. One of our participants says um, that he considers The Counter Life to be Roth's most intriguing and ingenious novel and wants to know how Roth regarded that particular book. As pivotal. Uh, he said, uh, I, I, really, I really became a good writer only with The Counter Life. He used to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, he really did feel it was a new beginning for him and was a, a quantum leap beyond what he'd done before. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I, I too have, uh, I share the, the uh, participants admiration for it. Uh, it's, a, it's a wild book, it's a strange book that violates all the canons of realism. Philip was a realist who would take uh, these radical holidays from realism. And then come back to realism. I love the narrative uh, jumpiness, if I can put it that way, of the counter life. I just find it... Uh, People who are dead come back to life. Yeah, engrossing. Um, you mention in your own book that you cite the scene in Sabbath theater where Mickey is describing the sensations of swimming at the Jersey shore when he was a child. And you say something like it's here. He, you say something like it's your quote, your favorite thing in all of Ross 31 books. And one of our uh, participants asked, why and how did you ever choose? Why? Uh, well, that's that lyrical uh, scene of little Mickey diving down to the bottom for a handful of sand to bring up and show his older brother Morty that he's to prove he's been to the bottom. Uh, well, it's personal. I, uh, I, I had a much older brother that I lost as well, and that's the that's the tragedy at the at the heart of Sabbath Theater. Mm -hmm. Sabbath Theater is a, is a very dirty book. Uh, it's also more profoundly a book about uh, a grief that does not subside. Right, right. The grief uh, already shot down over the Philippines in the last months of the war. Um, what were Roth's favorite among his own novels, do you think? Oh, I think he thought Sabbath's Theater was the... Was okay. I think he, he said to me, I, I wrote that book to let the whole creature out. <laughs> do you ever teach Sabbath's Theater? Yes, but that's a, that's, uh, a fool's errand. <laughs> I recommend teaching American Pastoral, exactly. which is about a man who is as clean as Mickey. <laughs> Mickey was filthy. So. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, what authors 
did Roth most admire? Well, as a young man, he tremendously admired Henry James. Uh, and he, and he, he read a lot of Dostoevsky when he was young. He never read Proust. Proust wasn't for him. Uh, uh, he, he, uh, among the French writers, it was, uh, it was Madame Bovary. Uh, he thought most highly of. And Céline, uh, in the Ralph Mannheim translations, he really was very influenced by Céline, I think, uh, once he started reading him. Uh, and, and from 1953 on, uh, I think Bella was a tremendous influence on him. As soon as he read The Adventures of Augie March, that book uh, influenced a whole generation. And I think uh, uh, all of those writers, one way and another, are children of Augie, certainly Philip was. And uh, uh, Chekhov, of course. He loved Chekhov. Well, I would say those are the those were the most important influences. It occurs to me to ask: When you teach Roth, do you ever also teach the books that influenced him? I think it was. I used to teach a course in which there were in which Bello and Roth were both. Okay. But you know these 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 men whose names were always bracketed together really were very different writers. They had different uh, uh, formations. Uh, Saul Bellow was the child of immigrants uh, who who come illegally from uh, Canada to I mean they were Russian immigrants who found themselves in Canada and then came to Chicago. Uh, Phillips. Uh, grandparents were immigrants. This is one thing that Philip and I, separated by a generation, did have in common. Uh, uh, our grandparents were immigrants. Our, our parents were certainly not. Our parents were completely Americanized. Mm -hmm. and we had that in common. Um, and also, Bellow writes about professional intellectuals. Uh, uh, Philip was less interested in that figure, the kind of person who would be at home at the Committee on Social Thought, the Committee for Social Thought at the University of Chicago, uh, more drawn to uh, um, people who do other kinds of work, run jewelry stores or operate glove factories or, or are um, uh, like Nathan Zuckerman, artists, rather than intellectuals, uh, uh, no idea merchants uh, uh, who, pro, who throng the pages of Bella, men like, like Moses Herzog. Sure. Um, I'm going to move on to some of the more personal questions that we've gotten in. You alluded earlier to Ross' desire to control people's perception of him. What were some of the misconceptions about him that he found most irritating? That he was stingy, which, which he, the opposite was true. He was immensely generous uh, on the QT with people. Uh, and uh, um, uh, that's, that certainly was something he bridled at. Uh, but he, um, he wanted to be um, he wanted not to be judged. He said to me about uh, uh, Blake Bailey's biography of John Cheever. He said, it's ideal. He doesn't uh, uh, judge his hero, his protagonist. He just lets him behave. Uh, mm -hmm. That is, I think I would say that is the reason that Philip chose Blake uh, on the, the strength of that uh, Cheever biography, and it's a moral latitudinarianism. Did Roth have any blind spots, and if so, what were they? Well, sure, geniuses have their blind spots too. Um, maybe that's a little too personal to go into. Uh, 
that, that, that's in the book. Could I just say that that's, that's all in the book? Uh, well directed. Um, did Roth ever discuss with you his relationship with Charles Cummings, the historian, the librarian um, and Newark historian with whom he worked at the Newark Public Library? Yes, uh, uh, briefly, but that's something I would like to know more about. Uh, uh, oh, if you okay. know. I, we can, I, I can and we can. I, there are people at the library who worked with Charles over many, many years, and uh, I will. I think he was in touch right along with Charles Cummings, but uh, uh, also I think when he was writing The Human Stain. Yes, I think Charles helped him with some of the background on uh, several of the books from that period. The African-American family, Coleman Silk's hidden family. Mm -hmm. um, Roth had many, many deep friendships. And as you describe it, long lasting ones with many of his closest friends gathered at his hospital, gathered at the hospital at the end of his life. I'm wondering what you think specifically characterized your friendship with Roth. And what especially drew you to each other? Hilarity, fun, <laughs> iconoclasm, and uh, a deep sympathy for a lot of the same things. We could talk about the books of Solvello for hours on end. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh. We loved watching movies together, though we couldn't agree on what, what to watch. Uh, he would sometimes give in to what I wanted to watch. I would sometimes give in to what he wanted to. His tastes were much more highbrow than mine. <laughs> uh, can you talk a little about his interest in music? It was very deep, and it was something he discovered in Chicago. Uh, in Chicago. <laughs> Chicago Symphony. Um, he never uh, responded to opera, though, or or to uh, vocal music of any kind. Uh, that, so far as I could tell, he loved chamber music, and we went to hear a series of Bartok together, a series of Shostakovich. Uh, I remember Schubert. Uh, these things were in him to the point where I think he no longer felt the need to listen later on in life. I don't, that's one of the mysteries that uh, perhaps uh, Philip's biographer will solve. Philip, and then, who listened so inveterately to music, at some point uh, after the year 2000, stopped listening. Maybe more like 2010, he stopped listening to music in the last years of his life. But it had been all important to him, and uh, he, I, I think, he brought some of what he learned listening to musical narrative back into his work. Uh, the books are, are, are musically composed; they have a kind of uh, perfection with uh, exposition and development and reprise and uh, certain things that are inherent both to uh, fiction and to music. And uh, I gather it's not universal. It seems like it ought to be universal for novelists to, uh, to love music, but apparently Nabokov, for example, couldn't stand music. <laughs> um, I'm going to conclude with two, if you'll allow me what may be a little bit of extra time. Uh, personal notes here, one for Maureen and one for you, Ben. For Maureen, we have a, um, Debbie Berlinstein is writing in, saying that she's sending her best regards to your husband because they went to school together. In Hillside, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> well, I will, I will pass on the, the uh, good wishes. <laughs> And thank you for a great presentation, she and Debbie also says. <laughs> okay. And um, Ben, finally, and this I'm going to also use the name, we have your niece Rhonda participating. 
and she has asked uh, perspicaciously, might there someday be a younger writer who will be this, your sidekick and confidant that you were to Philip? Um, I don't think there will be much call for that book. <laughs> and I don't know who the author would be. So <laughs> I think it's uh, that uh, it would be vainglorious of me to, to say that that could happen. Mostly what I'm focused on is uh, uh, what happened to me? Are we still on? Yes. Um, those are the questions that have been written in. Um, I, I'm not, per, okay, we're just over the time. Tom, would you like to come on for the program and thank our wonderful participants and our wonderful presenters? This is Tom Alritz, Interim Director of the Newark Public Library. And on behalf of the library, I want to extend a special thanks to Ben Taylor, author of Here We Are, My Friendship with Philip Roth, for sharing a reading and his comments and his insights into his relationship with Philip. It's been very enjoyable. And also a special thanks to our interviewer, Maureen Cargan from NPR's Fresh Air. Thanks to the Newark Public Library Foundation trustees and staff who planned and executed this event. With special thanks for Kirsten Jardy, our development director, Diego Quintero, our IT person, and Rosemary Steinbaum, our foundation chair. Thanks to all of you for attending the event. I hope that you enjoyed our program, learned a little more about Philip and possibly about the Philip Roth Personal Library coming to the Newark Public Library, and that you will join us in supporting the creation of the room as we enter our construction year. Please plan on joining us in about a year for the opening of the Philip Roth Personal Library at the Newark Public Library. So long for now, hope to see you at the library soon and have an enjoyable evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ben, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. Thanks, Tom.